point is what we're talking about with rotation. The, one of the great things about Chinese garden art is they make these uh, fantastic gardens and they lead you through these very intricate paths and you step here and you look and you see a different view of the same garden. And you, they tap path takes you over here and then you look at the same garden, but it looks different now because you're in a different place. The Yu Yuan Garden in Shanghai is amazing for that. So what we're looking for is how to rotate these vectors to give you a sense of how can I see the pattern better. And that allows us to interpret the results better. The lines of best fit, the vectors, are now arranged optimally to go through the clusters of data. So that's all we're doing is we're trying to make it easier to see where they are. And you've got a choice of orthogonal or oblique rotation. Orthogonal is the relationship between the wall and the floor. It's square, it's 90 degrees. Ortho means right. So it's the 90 degree angle. <sighs> Remember yesterday we saw the correlation between uh, Nicolas Cage movies and uh, drownings? That's not an orthogonal relationship. It's actually correlated. The world is correlated. So in what world would education research data be orthogonal? Not related. That they're where you are here is not related to where you are here. It's just almost impossible to imagine such a thing. So, in any research that requires insight to the human mind, or human emotions, or human actions, you better work with the assumption that variables, factors, are probably correlated. And if the correlation comes out at 0.001, then you can say, oh, well, okay, they're, all, they're really orthogonal, okay? But the odds on that are pretty small. Uh, if you're not sure, you can try both, but again, in education and psychology research, human behaviors and thoughts are probably not independent of each other. So, I don't know if I'd even bother trying. And if the correlation is more than 0.1, you know they're not orthogonal. They are correlated. So let's just start with that. So rotation has to do with can I put this set of vectors at the perspective point where I can now see, ah, that's what groups there, that's what groups here. So all we're doing is a mathematical rotation or transformation. Orthogonal wants to keep everything at 90 degrees, which is hard to believe. And very max rotation if you want to do orthogonal. And you, you'll read articles where people say, we did, P, we did factor analysis. We used PCA with very max rotation. You go, well, no, that's not factor analysis. Just, you know, like, no, you're kidding yourself. But a lot of people will try to do this because it forces items onto a smaller number of variables. It's more likely to capture... Um, simple structure. But oblique rotation is probably the one that explains reality better. So here's what Joe Movi gave me for the same six items, sorry, eight items, CE1 and uh, to six and PE1 and two. This is oblique and this is very max. What do you see that's different between these two results? The cross loadings are much stronger under Verimax. What does that mean? What's the implication? Sorry? It's not simple structure because these cross loadings suggest when you force it to zero, the items want to be on both because the two factors are not orthogonal the factors are actually correlated. That's what it's saying. That, wait a minute, how can you be, every, everything is on some, 
two or more things except for PE1 and CE1. And everything's on more than one factor because the factors are correlated, but you force them not to be correlated, so the items have to load on both to try, excuse me, to try and capture the reality of the data set. And can, and it, can it be the loading a little bit more than one? You know, we have one point zero. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, mm, yeah, okay, we'll look, at, we'll look into that. And you know, that, that usually tells me they're over, that these two items would be correlated with each other too strongly, and we don't need both items. Mm -hmm. And if you remember what the items look like, you could see maybe PE1 and 2 are duplicates of each other. So, factor names. Obviously, everybody tries to explain the factor with giving it a useful name because we're trying to simplify the world and the idea is, idea is to make the label fit. A really, really good study would go, here's a bunch of items. What do you think they have in common? You give this other set of items. What would you call this set? Test out. Get other people to look at it and go, oh, this seems to be X. Fine, thank you. And then you go and you write definition descriptions of your variable names. And then you go, here's a set of items. Here's the dictionary, de here's the labels. Which items go with these labels? You would systematically pilot test your labels and which items belong to the label to see if you've named your factors in a persuasive, clear way. Almost nobody does that. But maybe they should. Maybe, because everyone believes in the mental model. More well, everybody knows, I know what I mean, what's wrong with you? Can't you understand what I mean? You know, like, come on. If those of you who have lived with a person of the opposite sex know how easy it is to not understand each other. Ah, this is the article, this is, this is, if you don't own this book, I suggest you buy it, steal it, <laughs> get, a, get a photocopy, buy it off the black market, I don't care. This book is uh, Best Practices, uh, sorry, no, it's this one here, this first one here, Hancock and Mueller, The Reviewer's Guide to Quantitative Methods in the Social Sciences. It's now out in a second edition. I only own the first edition. And until one of the students steals it from me and then I have to buy the second edition. <laughs> this book is fantastic, not just for factor analysis, but for every quantitative method that's out there. And these authors have all said, when you're reading an article, this is what you should look for. And if you're a researcher, you know what the reviewers are going to look for, so you should be doing those things, right? So it's a great book. Really good book. Uh, Bandalus and Finney, uh, their article. Use maximum likelihood. It's the best estimate of the population variable. Don't use PCA. Use oblique rotation, not orthogonal. Aim for three items per factor. But you saw yesterday that some of my factors don't have three items. I'll explain why, that, why we can get away with that. Uh, you can get away with it if you have a multi factor inventory. But if you're just saying, here's a factor, you want three or more items. People will go, no, oh, don't trust two. But if you have six factors in all connected to each other, you can have a two item factor in there. Excuse me. Can yeah. you repeat the case when we have when we can have two items? Sure, 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 sure. Let's see if I can draw a picture more easily. So, if you just have one factor, we want three or more. But if you have one, two, three factors, and they are correlated, this one has three or more, this one only has two, this one has three or more, then you can get away with a two-item factor in a context where there are other factors related, modeled simultaneously. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah.
<laughs> so we can keep this to a variable, yes, that factor. Yes. You have to make a little dance to explain to the reviewer or examiner <laughs> that this is okay, and that dance comes from Boland 1989. Right. Okay, so now I put in two factors, the affect, social, and external attributions factors. I ran maximum likelihood estimation with oblique, and I used regressions. And you can see here, factor one is PE, PE, CE, 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 CE. All the six that I thought should go together as affect social. And factor two starts here. I've sorted it by size. But SQ2, eh, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. It's not strong on either. It's the wait a minute, damn you weirdo. I didn't, you didn't behave the way I wanted you to. And, but the rest are pretty strong. And notice, these values are not zero. They will never be zero. Everything is correlated with everything. But they're so small, if we choose to ignore them, does my simple structure fit the data? That's the question we have to ask. There's a correlation between them, because I ran Oblomid, so it's 0.6. So they're not zero correlated, they're 36% shared. Okay. There's enough to be different, but there's something in common. Chi-square test. 332, 64. Meh. Statistically significant usually means not true. Different from the data. Right? That's the chi-square test is a test of does my model fit the data? And the answer is, it's the difference is statistically significant. So therefore, this model is not does not correspond with the data. But what do we know about our friend chi square? What did we talk about yesterday about chi square? A problem with chi square. Sample. A very small increase in numbers give, makes chi-square very sensitive. Because chi-square is the difference between what I expected and what I observed. Right? What I expected is the data. What I observed is my model. Or is it the other way around? Yeah. Let's the other way around. Thank you. Thank you. My model compared to the data. We're looking for the discrepancy. And what did it say? 332 with 64 degrees of freedom. When you look that up on any chi-square calculator, that P is less than 0 0.000. It's some very small number. Therefore, the difference is greater than would occur by chance. Okay? Therefore, my model and data are not the same. Okay, that's what that's how you have to interpret it. But we also know that chi square is very sensitive when 64 degrees of freedom are present. Lots of freedom. So six into three hundred is what? This is around five. Anybody got a calculator? It's 332 divided by 64. What's the number? Because now we would have the ratio of chi-square to degrees of freedom. And the answer is? 5.18. Okay. What's the p-value of 5.19 with one degree of freedom? It's not going to be as small as 332 with 64. I'm, I don't want to write it in that R, and I don't know how. Anyway, so I just go, is, am I connected to the internet? Mm. Let's find out. That'll work. 
Good machine, you could do it. Oh, we lost. Can't connect to this NES. Okay, try Moscow Wi Fi free. This website, if we can get connected to the internet, please, machine. What do I have to do? Uh, maybe I'll check the make sure it's not all the No, it's all the There it is. Excellent. So this website is a free website that calculates the chi-square value and the p-value if you have two out of three. And it's got the formula. And it'll also check your computer to make sure you have the right system. And down here, you can put in the new numbers. Let me push that up. So we said 5.19 with one degree of freedom. And now it's 0.02. So which is the truth? Is it really P is less than 0 0.001? Or is it P is equal to 0 0.02? Remember, all I did was divide the total number of chi-squares by the total number of degrees of freedom to give the ratio of chi-square to D degree of freedom. And this is something I recommend you do because remember, factor analysis is a large data technique. You need a lot of big data. You usually have lots of variables because it's a mimic model, multiple indicators. So obviously we have complex models with lots of variables and lots of people. So we get very big degrees of freedom. And when we divide it back to a ratio, what we find is, well actually, maybe it's not as bad as someone says it is. Ideally, we want this to be 0.05 or bigger. So, I would be going, eh, I wouldn't sell this model yet. I'd be saying, hmm, interesting, promising, let's keep going, add some more factors in to my model to see if it works the way I want. And at the bottom here, if you have the p-value, and the degrees of freedom, it'll tell you what the chi-square is. Isn't that nice? It's free. Open access. By a guy who works as a researcher in Switzerland. And he calls it Fourmilab, <coughs> which is the French word for ant. Fourmi. From which we get formic acid. And I'm back to here. And I was on the last page anyway. Is it time for us to stop? Have I timed it perfectly? 10 to 11.30? Five minutes. Five minutes. Any questions? About anything? Have I gone too fast? Or, yeah, we knew this. We just, it was a nice word for reminder. Yes? Uh, about decisions. Uh, our aim is to, um, to select items that represent the factor, but not select too much factor, uh, items to the factor. So to, to everything, so to have final version with what is quite short, but uh, represent uh, the construct. The construct. Yes, you're trying to represent the construct efficiently because the full set of items that represent a construct is very long, mm -hmm. and nobody will give you that much time or energy and 
it would be cruel and unusual to force people to do a thousand items so that you, which makes you wonder about personality inventories with, was it 192 items or something? You know what? You must be kidding. Um, who, who cares enough? And uh, if you want more than 20 minutes of someone's time, you're probably going to have to pay them somehow or be really super nice to them. So efficiency matters. But representativeness does too. So it's a balancing act between how much data can I get and how much data do I need to represent the construct of interest. And how we select items what we leave and what we can take away. If, we, for example, they have a similar loading to the factor, they yeah. have a similar reaction indexes and discrimination, so they're quite similar. So. Uh, we choose it based on the theory or on just on chance? No, you must always be guided by theory. But if they're similar... If similar, they're similar, then yeah. you can toss a coin. <laughs> you know, which one... If these two items look like each other, they're correlated with each other, and they're equally loaded on the item, then... <laughs> run it. Switch it, run it, which one fits better? Okay, so you can systematically do a sensitivity analysis. You can say, well, these two items were really equivalent. They seem to be duplicate or redundant. So I removed one, ran the analysis, switched it back, ran the analysis and compared the results and chose the one that was closest to the data. So remember, factor analysis the fit of a model is all about, does it correspond with the data? Assuming your data is right, right? Which means you spend some time checking the data, cleaning the data, you making sure you've got the right participants, you know. Your data has to be as right as rain. Otherwise, your model is nonsense. You're fitting to something that's wrong. But when you... But when these gentlemen, are, these people are working on the, you know, the test system for all of Azerbaijan, and they've got all 50,000 kids doing this test, they're sure they have the population. The only people not participating are the ones that are so rich, they leave the country to go do to someone else's exam, like the International Baccalaureate, thank you very much, or so poor and low achieving that they don't even get to that part of the school system. They already left school. So, you know, they're pretty sure they got the 90% confidence interval of all the people in the country. So, that's, they don't have to worry about this problem. You and I, when we're collecting data in schools from teachers, from parents, and from students, we have to care about, does our data look, do our, does our obtained sample look like population. Is it large enough and is it representative enough? And it's always a bit of a guesswork. And it's a bit of a, I know I might be wrong here, folks. You know, like I checked, it's not bad, but I still got that paper published that had only a much higher performing group participating than the rest of the class. You can still get it published as long as you're honest about it. This result is dependent on high, this is how high performing students see the world. Getting the low performing students to give you the data, that's a harder ask. Unless you can compel them. And that's hard. Any other questions or comments before you go for coffee? Hi, enjoy your coffee break then. Thank you. Thank you.